Hi everyone, Christina Bauer, Texas Lyme Alliance, Founder and Executive Director, Lyme Coach, and Mom of Four Congenital Lyme Kids and Patient, all doing well. I'm bringing you a powerful presentation by Dr. Tim Haystead out of Duke University in honor of the work of Dr. Neil Spector, renowned oncology researcher of Duke University who lost his battle from complications of Lyme disease. They have found a new investigational therapy regimen capable of irreversibly damaging the Lyme bacteria in lab tests. This work was funded by a generous grant by the Bay Area Lyme Foundation on November 1st of 2023. And in collaboration with Project Lyme, we are also fundraising for this work as it has identified a potential diagnostic tool out of this work as well as a potential new drug known as HS291. This work was inspired by research that targets cancer tumors and these new findings in Lyme disease could also lead to novel R&D strategies for other diseases. This work is going to take in total around $10 million to bring to the public. So we are also fundraising. If you could go to our website and make any donation possible, we are funding this work as well as opening access to care from other treatments as well. Our web address is txlimealliance.org forward slash donate and subscribe to our channel. Hello, uh, my name is Tim Haystead, and I'll just give you a brief overview of our um, Borrelia program and how we're going about developing a novel series of inhibitors that um, target Borrelia uh, through a protein called heat induced protein G, which is found in uh, many bacterial species. But there's a specific form in Borrelia that we are targeting. Um, we're developing this as a diagnostic and a therapeutic uh, target um, by developing PET enabled agents. Um, here is actually the uh, structure of the protein. Um, it's conserved in many species um, from human all the way through to the most primitive organism but our technology enables us to discriminate those species by developing uh, small molecules that carry um, specific probes and ultimately a pet agent to target the species so that we can see it um, inside somebody's body uh, non-invasively. And the protein that really looks like this, this is a, a dimer found in all, all cells and our molecules look like this. They, there's a, a region where the, uh, uh, we bind and target the, um, the organism's protein and there's this tether attached to it, you'll see in a moment, and then something is uh, on the outside that enables us to visualize that either down a microscope or um, in a PET machine, ultimately. Um, it can also be used to deliver a toxin, which I'll show uh, to kill the organism. Um, so we, when we set out on this, uh, we initially asked this question, can we detar target specifically Borrelia burgdorferi HTPG? Um, <coughs> we, asked, we were able to ask that question because we had actually specifically targeted the human form. So humans have a protein called HSP90, which is the ortholog of the bacterial version, these prokaryotes called HTPG. <coughs> But if you uh, look at the biology of these two proteins um, and their functions, um, um, importantly, they are actually um, quite abundant. That makes it a good candidate for PET. Um, they do have a required um, function in cells, and they think it's related to temperature changes in the environment, that they have some role there. But it turns out this is not the central role. And again, some of these things add up. We know now to make the this uh, particular protein ideal for developing a PET agent for detecting infections. If we look at the 
amino acid sequence of these proteins compared to human there's only about 60 percent amino acid identity with the human form so that makes it relatively easy um, from a medicinal chemistry point of view to develop specific inhibitors for Borrelia over the human and we've actually done that and there is about uh, even variation between that and other prokaryotic species like E. coli or other relevant spirochetes like Tropomia denticoli and we um, have evidence that we can separate these species from Borrelia so we could make a probe that is absolutely diagnostic of Borrelia infection and not to be confused with other species and the, these are the things that we are doing um, to enable what I'm about to talk about um, there's a great deal of work obviously um, we began our program by trying to define um, what we call ligands that will bind specifically to Borrelia over human and then um, use that as a starting place to make very specific molecules that really don't recognize human anymore at all you'll see that in a moment but only only recognize the Borrelia BBHTT over here <coughs> and the way we go about this is first we um, purify um, this protein and use that to um, create a crystal structure of a starting ligand which we used in this particular case. This blue line was a particular ligand we were interested in that we worked on a bit that targeted the human form but also showed selectivity over the human for the bacteria which was a good starting place. Um, with our colleague Mac Redembo at, at uh, University of North Carolina we derive a crystal structure of this chemical starting point and that starting point that binds to Borrelia um, it also does bind to the human um, was used to develop a uh, specific molecule where we dialed out interactions with the human form that weren't present in the bacterial form through what's called SAR structure activity relationships uh, this crystal structure enables us to understand all of the chemical interactions with our starting material um, so we can make specific inhibitors. Um, um, and we were able to verify through biochemical means at, a, at the molecular level the specificity and affinity of this starting point and understand how we could disrupt binding to the human version and why other forms of human targeted inhibitors won't bind to the Borrelia one so that was um, some pretty hard science that we got into um, ultimately we end up um, developing a new compound um, from this by uh, understanding all these interactions making substitutions all around these molecules that are predicted to be essential for interaction with, with the Borrelia but would dial away the human version but retain all these potencies it would also allow us to put a tether on there that we can develop the molecule into an imaging agent so you can see from these numbers they're up in the hundreds we were able to plot during doing classical binding studies um, new molecules that we had synthesized and plot their affinity towards the bacterial version over the human and it took a lot longer than we thought but we ended up making many hundred different variants and at the end of the day we were able to derive a new compound um, that only targets the Borrelia and eliminated the human uh, versions that are the, so this particular ligand is very potent it won't bind human but it will pick up Borrelia so that was a major milestone in our program and we were able to put a tether on this to make a pet agent out of it now um, interestingly when we looked at some other species of spirochete with this same ligand um, which you can see these are amino acid sequence alignments where the compound binds and what contacts with the new version are conserved across species and regions where there are clear difference between Borrelia and the next closest neighbor which is Denticola and uh, 
T. palladium, the rickettsia, and, and leptospirilia, all um, spirochetes that might confound any kind of diagnostic. But we already have uh, one that dials out two of these. It has left in the denticola, which is the oral um, spirochete that is associated with dental caries. Um, uh, not known to be disseminated throughout the body like Borrelia, but um, still binds and we're currently just going to see if we can separate these two and there's promise some amino acid residues over here that are different. We think we could dial out the uh, Tentacola. Um, just to show you how specific our uh, molecule is, is that we can take, um, we can turn it into an affinity ligand and mix it with Borrelia extracts and use it to recover the native Borrelia protein from those complex extracts in very pure form. So we're absolutely confident that if we mix this with a biological mixture, we're only going to recover Borrelia, not other proteins. And furthermore, we have these tethers. And here's an example of one of the tethered versions <coughs> we've developed, called HS291. They have a ligand here that recognizes the Borrelia. There is this arm on it, it's a peg polyethylene glycol arm and on it we can attach an imaging agent or a poison in this case to kill the organism. I'm going to show some data with that. So we've constructed these molecules routinely now and you'll see in a moment we can, as I described, target the Borrelia with this piece. It's attached to uh, this part. It doesn't That attachment doesn't affect the binding. We, can, we know that from this affinity experiment. And now it can carry um, a payload and that payload in this case in one case is a poison that generates reactive oxygen to kill cells in others as you'll see we have ones that now carry um, radio metals for PET and this is where we are um, for our clinical campaign so we take this HS291 molecule and we mix it with <coughs> Borrelia culture in the, um, this molecule is light activated. In the absence of light, the molecule um, does nothing. Um, if we activate the molecule with red light, which is uh, to penetrating red light near infrared, we use it in photodynamic therapy, it causes the molecule to generate reactive oxygen species locally, which is lethal to the organism and literally sterilizes the culture, so it kills the culture. We can try to propagate um, this culture after treatment, so a single treatment completely sterilizes the culture. And we can see in these dose responses, when we look at the culture 24 hours, 48 hours, 72 hours, and 168 hours later, at the higher concentrations here, the culture remains sterile. So a single dose can kill Morel Morelia very effectively, implying that the, these molecule is, up, is taken up by the organism by binding to the HTPG protein. This works on other strains in, in a similar manner. Um, one can make the drug more potent by giving more light. It shifts these dose responses to the left. And one can also um, see that the uptake of the molecule, the maximal effect of uptake, is very rapid, happening within minutes. We'll see some more of that. If one takes these cultures and looks at them down a microscope, um, in these movies what you see, film play, um, you can see that this is what a normal culture looks like under the microscope in dark field. You can see the organism wiggling around. Once you expose it to light, within 15 minutes the organism stops moving so something happened and then if you look at it um, 24 hours uh, post treatment you see nothing the organism appears to be completely uh, destroyed uh, not present in the culture it's completely fallen apart so that's good If we look at the um, what's going on in more detail, and this is very recent data, if we take the components of that 
HS291, which is vertiforin, is the poison. Now you look at the uptake of the poison alone, or treatment of poison alone, that can kill, as expected, the organism in this titration experiment. It doesn't act um, get any better if we add the ligand part of the molecule, that's the other, when it's not tethered. Um, but interestingly, we can wash away this effect very easily by washing the cells. So if we just have the poison part on its own, most of its activity is washed away very easily by simply taking the cultures and washing the cells. Well, if we do the same experiment with our drug, we cannot wash it away. It means there's active uptake. And we can then follow this in real time by isolating the cells, uh, incubating them in for different lengths of time at a single dose, and they're recovering from those cells after they've been washed the HS291 molecule. And it's it, it gets it's very rapidly taken up and it saturates maximally in 90 minutes. Um, and a minute you can see we, we also measure very high concentrations over here using this method. We use a combination of reverse phase HPLC and mass spectrometry to measure this as well as fluorescence because um, <coughs> the molecule fluoresces. Uh, uptake is affected by temperature, suggesting an active mechanism. So at 4 degrees we get less uptake, at 34 degrees we get uh, more uptake, suggesting an active mechanism of uptake. Uh, we can, this molecule HS291 carrying the vertiforin is fluorescent and we can actually see by fluorescence in the field of cultures in, under a fluorescence microscope the drug being absorbed into the Borrelia in this very characteristic way. It goes into all stages of the life cycle. Compare this to the non-tethered vertiforin. There's no uptake there so we're getting targeted and in fact these organisms it tur turns out takes up so much of this drug within 90 minutes you they actually become dark stained and you can see them in a bright field and the, the staining of, of the drug seems to correlate with DNA staining within the organism this contrast to vertiforin alone where we don't really see any uptake into the organism um, but we do see the DNA staining uh, if we drill further into selective spirochetes within the fields, um, we see this unusual pattern of drug ups, uptake where you get these uh, concentrations within the organism that we believe are um, the points of replication or nucleoid clusters found in uh, <coughs> or, uh, spirochetes within any given field is undergoing replication and again that seem, that staining seems to correlate with DNA. We don't see that phenomenon with the free vertiforin. You can see this at higher resolution. You can see these um, clusters of um, uh, nucleoid clusters and correlation with drug uptake rather nicely within uh, these uh, particular spirochetes. So it's quite convincing that the organism is actively taking up the HS291 drug by binding to the HTPG protein. So they've got very effective targeting and this becomes going to become very important both for PET imaging and, and therapeutically. You can see this is just some of the detailed HLS, HL, HPLC analysis we did to calculate the concentration per cell and in cells it gets up to these quite high level therapeutic levels and you can see in this picture a picture of a culture that's been spun down by a, in a centrifuge the extent to the accumulation of these HS291 compared to the control and free vertiforin it literally starts to look quite black actually which is the color of the vertiforin itself <coughs> I think we've discovered a, <coughs> a novel transport mechanism involving HTPG that can be exploited to image and kill Borrelia burgdorferi. The mechanism of cell death is very interesting. It turns out when we in those um, those response images I showed, um, the data we showed where we were killing in the presence of light. If you look at the organism under micro 
uh, electron microscopy using transmission electron microscopy um, you can see that the drug causes these regions of um, electron density they call it which turns out to be gold particle staining of DNA itself so here's an intact spirochete in that in one of our dose responses that has been um, taking up this drug and it appears to be causing the DNA of the organism um, which is normally found scattered throughout the organism it's um, <coughs> has uh, anywhere between 10 or 11 copies of a single chromosome it's normally dispersed throughout the organism in the normal control uh, when it's given our drug seems to cause the uh, DNA to lose its protein complement we think and collapse to the middle rather spectacularly um, and we could measure this reduction um, in condensation of DNA uh, using fluorescent means uh, state-of-the-art methods this was work done in NIH uh, where we can measure the effect of the drug on the nucleoid thickness and it shown that it redu was reduced significantly to a single uh, to uh, this strand running actually from one end of the organism to the other so uh, quite a dramatic effect and quantitate that ver that, that variation or that change um, in, you, in this particular movie you can actually show how elegant the effect was um, here we had um, taken a single uh, spirochete after and stained it with gold particles and highlighted that electron density region in, in in yellow here and you can see how that DNA strand or strands is collapsed into the middle of the organism which is a very unique biological observation potentially tells us a bit about how <coughs> the chromosome structure of this organism is managed and we're not sure whether what we're observing here is a drug-induced effect that's unique to the drug or a biological response, a stress response, where the organism is trying to protect its DNA by keeping it in the middle of the uh, organism till presumably the stress or drug goes away. But we do know once this happened, it, it was a terminal event and that the, the organism doesn't recover, which is really important. <coughs> this um, we were so excited about this that we actually asked a, a guru in the, in the who's an expert in uh, Borrelia um, DNA composition and chromosome structure, Christine Jacobs Wag Wagner at, at Stanford, to have a look at look at this, and she was able to re reproduce this nu nucleoid thinning and condensation by epifluorescent studies in her own lab and also show that the drug um, ultimately causes an increase in membrane permeabilization and blebbing of the organism which we also observed in the in the um, in our TEM studies which accounts for the sterilization of the culture where complete cellular breakdown is initiated uh, upon activation of the drug with light so where are we now now uh, where we are is um, at a point where we're now moving this all this cell-based work into animals. And we're doing this in two studies. One is to see if we can uh, treat animals with the light-activated drug to clear an infection. And we started this work with Amir Hodzik at uh, UC Davis, who injected the the uh, HS291 drug into um, mice along with a new, our newest Borrelia specific version which is called HS502 and then sent back tissues to us for analysis by mass spectrometry to look at uptake into tissues where we where he has shown in the past Borrelia accumulates uh, once you infect the mice and uh, we got a very interesting result in which we saw accumulation of the drugs in, in the ventricle and in the um, tibial tarsus muscle which is two places it's known to go um, but that's quite convincing and in the right trend um, and we're actually conducting histological studies on these samples these are 
have acid analysis for the presence of the drug in individual animals at two different times. <coughs> um, so we may be able to see visually through fluorescence in histology experiments, so waiting on this data now, evidence of uptake into Borrelia in vivo, which would render it susceptible if we can get light to, to the uh, uh, Borrelia to kill it and eliminate the infection. Um, so that, that's one, one, that's the first step to a clinical campaign. Uh, the next is what we're working on is we think about um, this drug being dispersed throughout, if you go back one here a second, being dispersed throughout the animal um, uh, would, you know, how, how could we activate it with light in, if it was a human being, could we get through the tissues? deliver light. Uh, we're not sure about that, but we've also developed compounds now that can absorb x-rays um, and generate light internally and intramolecular, and we've made these in the lab, to transfer that light um, by penetrating x-rays to the uh, vertiform molecule and as a mode of treatment where you wouldn't need red light, but you could use simple x-rays like you get for your uh, bone x-ray to clear an infection systemically that's by causing this molecule to generate O minus. These are things that we are working on. Uh, we're bringing the animal model infection to test this idea out. Um, we do know that in theory and it works. Um, we've designed molecules that can capture the, the x-rays and transfer that, that energy to the vertifor end and in culture in this initial experiment um, demonstrate that it would kill the organism. So that feasibility is is there. And it's something that a strategy where we could think about these molecules trying to clear chronic infections in people. Now really where we think we are headed and what we are actively doing is we were very successful recently in obtaining a small animal pet CT machine. It's going to be installed in August to make pet enabled versions so that we can uh, give these molecules to patients with um, unresolved uh, disease and image um, live Borrelia in those people if they have an underlying infection and the way we're going about that is again we have this uh, Borrelia specific ligand we've developed we have a peg of it but this time instead of carrying a poison it carries a a molecule, a chelate as it's known, that can carry radio metals, which are many of these, that can be seen in a PET um, CT machine, uh, commonly used for detecting cancers and other things in people. So this sa that those same instruments could be used to diagnose an underlying infect Borrelia infection in a human, which is one of the biggest elephants in the room. Um, this would provide the first evidence, uh, convincing evidence, that someone who has a chronic condition that did not resolve through antibiotic treatment is because of an underlying um, infection. And we believe that would also uh, detect dormant um, bacteria, um, dormant Borrelia based on our culture analysis where we can overgrow cultures and cause them to, co to form biofilms, yet we're still able to demonstrate that those biofilms would take these probes up, probably through the same transport mechanism that we discovered for um, in, in the uh, growing organism in culture. So we're very hopeful. Um, so we're currently uh, <coughs> raising money to support the animal work uh, necessary to trigger an IND filing and money will be required to support that work to then go to the FDA um, to put one of these molecules into clinical development. We have high hopes that they will work. We've already mentioned briefly had much of this work came out of our work on cancer we very recently completed a clinical trial where we took similar molecules 
to demonstrate that we could detect metastatic disease in humans. This was men with prostate cancer safely with these types of molecules. So we have every reason to believe that um, if our animal studies are positive in it with our PET machine, we will generate the kind of data that we can take to the FDA to initiate an iodine campaign. From there we would go within a year to uh, thinking about a clinical trial um, in patients probably newly infected to uh, verify the probes are working and then on to people that have chronic infections um, to show the presence of active disease by PET. Uh,